After beating Platinum as a hardcore Nuzlocke using only the evolutions, I decided to take your advice and do the same thing in Kalos, attempting to beat it as a hardcore Nuzlocke, getting one Eevee after each gym, and matching major battle team sizes. Before we begin, which new evolution type would you most like to see? For me, it would probably be either Steel or Ghost. Both of those would be pretty awesome. My alarm clock is a bit more violent than most, but it does the job. The Wii U, on the other hand, doesn't. It just never took off. Before heading downstairs, I look into the mirror and change out of my pajamas. What an incredible achievement. Good thing I'm dressed, because a couple of weirdos are standing just outside my door. This group of kids has an awkward conversation about nicknames, culminating in me becoming Big B. Okay, I guess. At this point, I'm offered a Pokemon and pick the most Eevee-like one, though he's very clearly not an Eevee. I'm forced into a Pokemon battle with not Eevee, but this doesn't really matter that much. If I don't get an Eevee soon though, my evolution research will start to suffer. Professor Sycamore tells my mom he needs my evolution expertise, and so, after reading a single letter from this professor who she has never met, by the way, she tells me to go work with his stranger and kicks me out of the house. She seems awfully glad to be rid of me. At least Rhyhorn will miss me. If only you were an Eevee, you could come along too. After traveling through a couple unimportant eevee routes, but I repeat myself, I arrive in Santaloon City. In the PC, there is a wonderful Eevee named Dawkins, waiting for me. With that, my journey officially begins. This lady tells me that I can impede the process of natural selection simply by pressing the B button. Um, who am I to stand up against Mother Nature? Why do us humans always think we know best? In this case though, I do know best. After all, there are only three evolutions available to me right now. While any of them could easily defeat Viola, I decide to start with the one I couldn't use in Sinnoh. And so, after playing around, and maybe a hint of cheating, Dokken's selfish genes prevail and is affectionate enough to evolve into Sylveon. And can I just take a moment to point out how stupid it is that friendship and affection are two separate mechanics? I honestly have no idea why they felt the need to introduce affection and keep it for the next few generations, it's just weird. With a full team of one Pokemon, it's time to tight walk on a web. Which is terrifying because I hate spiders. They just give me the heebie-jeebies. Anyway, on to the creepy bug lady. Viola starts with Surskit, who Dawkins takes out in a couple of fairy winds after being bubbled. The Vivian is a bit tougher. Infestation is weak, but it does deal damage every turn, so hopefully Dawkins can survive. Vivian does fall in love right after infesting Dawkins with a virus. Even with that, Dawkins defeats this bug and didn't even need his Oran Berry. As you might imagine, early game will be pretty simple since all the evolutions have base stat totals of 525, so unevolved Pokemon really don't stand a chance. But that's the point! This is natural selection in action. Or maybe it's divine creation, since these Eevees appear out of nowhere? Speaking of, after defeating a gym leader, I get another Eevee. This one is called Moraine, who should actually be Moran. I didn't realize I misspelt it the entire time. On Route 4, I encounter two mini-scientists talking about the newest Pokemon type, of which I am already an expert. There is Cinna, a beautiful name for a beautiful lady, but just so you know, that doesn't count if you're the one who says it, and just Dexio. He is not beautiful. They take me to Sycamore's lab, who immediately wants to battle me. Even though two of his Pokemon resists Fairy, they are all so basic they don't stand a chance. Dawkins also has returned to help out. The professor gives me another starter, but they are still not Eevees, so I really don't care. The two girls also get another starter, but Tierno and the guy who seems like a girl but isn't are out of luck. Sycamore did not bring enough Pokemon to share with the whole class. And now, the real reason I'm here in Kalos are Mega Evolutions. You see, after evilly beating the Sinnoh region and learning all about evolutions, Rowan suggested I come to Kalos to help Sycamore with his Mega Evolution research. Now, Eevees can't Mega Evolve, there's no such thing as Mega Evolution, which is stupid, but I decided to come here anyway. Before leaving the most confusing Poke City ever, I can never find anything in this place, I meet Lysander. Twice, actually. And this guy is obviously an Eevee fan because they are all so lovely. As is my name, apparently. Take that, Cena. Wasn't even self-imposed. Now, there are plenty of places to visit here, but the only one I really care about is the Stone Emporium, where I can buy a few Evolution stones. And apparently I'm already famous. What exactly have I done so far to warrant this adoration? With those rocks in hand, 
and looking ahead to the next gym, I decide to evolve Moran into Vaporeon. I know I'm opening a whole can of worms by using a female Vaporeon, but we're all mature adults here, right? Or at least adults? Okay, never mind. Let's just move on. On Route 5, I am assaulted by a Lucario. Keep your dog on a leash, Corina Jish. Then, Tierno tries to battle me with a Corfish, but Dawkins is just too strong. Stick to your dancing, man. You got nothing on me. I try to just pass through Camphir Town, but I'm stopped by a guy who goes on and on about how great the Shabanui Castle is. Take that back, it's kinda cool. Or at least okay? Well, you convinced me, random dude. But first, another dude taunts my Eevees because they will never be dragon type. Do you guys think there will ever be another evolution at some point? I mean, it's already been three generations since Sylveon, that's the longest it's ever been. The girl who is not Serena and I get lectured by this black belt about the castle's history, but he knows literally nothing about Mega Evolution. He does know that you need a polka flute to wake up Snorlax. At this point, I want to take a moment to congratulate the Pokemon engineers for making a little bridge like that sturdy enough to hold such a fat Pokemon. That's pretty impressive. Game Freak though, reusing such a path blocker? Not so impressive. Be original, guys. Allegedly, there is a Poke Flute in Parfum Palace, but we need to pay 1,000 Poke Dollars to enter because the owner firmly believes that you can never have too much money. What a coincidence! Me too. So subscribe to the channel to get more videos like this, and check out my Patreon or YouTube memberships, that way the very not rich, like myself, can get some money. All the YouTube proceeds will go to make my videos even better. Probably. We save this rich guy's Pokemon, and he rewards us in the most reasonable way possible, by throwing together a fireworks show. What, you don't have a closet full of backup fireworks in case you need to celebrate? What a boring life you lead. After that life-changing spectacle, Mr. Butler says that Mega Evolution involves holding up a mysterious stone to make a Pokemon evolve. Don't listen to this man, he's obviously delusional. That's just a regular evolution. I did it like five minutes ago. With that Poke Flute in hand, I masterfully defeat the Snorlax, and not Serena wonders aloud where he went. Um, he went to the mountains. Did you not see that text bubble right there? After a very uneventful battle against Big T and Little T, I can make up stupid nicknames too, I break my Rhyhorn's trust by gallivanting with a new, younger Rhyhorn. How else am I going to get to Glittering Cave to stop Team Flair? Right before the next gym, a random lady offers to massage Moran my Vaporeon. Well, this just got awkward. Grant has a much better gym than the creepy bug lady, but that doesn't stop Moran from water pulsing Amora. It takes a few turns thanks to a thunder wave and hyper potions. Isn't this a bit early for a hyper potion? It's only the second gym. Sure enough, Littlefoot goes down, but Chomper survives an Aurora Beam and then gets a critical bite, putting Moran into the danger zone and flinching her. I wanted her to win this on her own, but there's no need to risk it. After all, Dawkins can come out to finish the battle with a kiss. After defeating this super easy flare grunt, I get the last evolution stowed I need, and in the same area several encounters later, I find the first legitimate Eevee of the run. This guy ends up being timid, minus attack and plus speed, so I decide to allow Kaufman to self-organize into a Jolteon. He is going to be stupid fast. Corina challenges me to a battle with a couple of Lucarios, but with Dawkins' kissing abilities, it's not really a problem. Before reaching Shalor City, I'm informed by Sycamore of a so-called Mega Evolution guru who, as you might imagine, knows a thing or two about Mega Evolution. Which raises the question, what the heck have I been doing the past two gyms? If Sycamore knew of a guy called the Mega Evolution guru, shouldn't he be the first stop in my Mega Evolution journey? Someone did not think this out very well. Oh yeah, and I'm also reminded that a flying Eevee is not a thing. That's not fair. And again, with the flying Eevee. Before entering the Tower of Mastery, Tierno gives me an intriguing stone under the assumption it's related to Mega Evolution. Turns out, it's just a dumb rock. But it's the thought that counts, right? The Guru explains basically everything about Mega Evolution. I still can't believe Sycamore never even thought to ask this guy. And just like the Professor, Guru did not bring enough Mega Bracelets to share with the class. Naturally, this means a fight breaks out between Serena and I to see who gets it. While it is nice to have a non-cheated Eevee, because Kaufman was caught at such a high level, he has no electric moves. He does have Pin Missile, but with minus attack, it's not that great. Even with Metronome, he does get lucky with 5 hits and takes out Meowstic easily enough. For the Absol, Dawkins can take a few hits, including a Crit Slash, and heals with Kisses. 
Frogadier uses Quick Attack a few times, but deals even less than Docking's heals, so even without being a Dark type, he stands no chance. Serena is clearly upset at this loss, but that doesn't stop me from gloating the winner that I am. Karina, don't take this win away from me. We literally can't all be winners, that's not how it works. In spite of my clear victory, to get a Mega Bracelet, I need to head to the gym and win yet again. Good thing it's so easy for me, huh? During the Rad Roller Skating Contest in the gym, I almost lose to a critical brick break from Heracross, and I think that's the closest I've gotten so far to losing anyone in this run. But I can't stay mad at Heracross, he's just too perfect. Anyway, after proving my roller skating skills, it's time to prove my strength. While Dawkins could easily kiss his way through her whole team, that guy is way more active than I'm ready for, if you know what I mean, I want to give Moran a try first. Mindfu is water pulsed after a fake out and a power up punch. And then how Lucha hones his claws, forcing me to abandon everything I just said. Bring on the kisses! And thanks to the water pulse confusion, Dawkins isn't even hit. So I guess Moran could have stayed in. Oh well. Since everyone else has contributed so far, let's give Kaufman a try. Unfortunately, the best move he has is Swift, which is not all that strong. After being slowed down three times from Rock Tomb, he calls it quits, and once again, I bring out Dawkins. If nothing else, this was more interesting than just a kiss sweep, huh? At the top of the Tower of Mastery, Corina wants a 1v1 battle of her Lucario against her other Lucario. And apparently this random dog and I have a great relationship because the Guru kept mentioning how that was necessary for Mega Evolution. Okay, either way, this intense battle is over on the first turn thanks to a 4-hit Bone Rush. Yeah, that wasn't an anticlimactic first Mega Evolution or anything. She tries to give me this Lucario as a present, but after he stares deeply and intently into my eyes, I recall our first encounter. You know, the one where he sniffed me? I'm out. Sycamore is excited that I finally achieved Mega Evolution. Um, what? I've been at this for like a day, and I've already got it down. How much Mega Evolving have you done, old man? Even this girl who makes random Pokemon noises is more impressive than he is. In front of the next gym, Serena wants to battle again, but we literally just did this. Kaufman again takes out Meowstic, but then needs to swap to Dawkins on the Absol, who is crit, but he survives. Frogadier confuses him, so I bring out Moran with a return. The frog does basically nothing to her, so he finishes the battle simple enough. Serena doesn't seem to understand the difference between us. Well, I do. She only uses three Pokemon and has zero evolutions. What kind of Pokemon team is that? In preparation for Old Man Ramos, the newest Eevee, Gould, undergoes punctuated equilibrium to quickly diverge into a Flareon. And can I just point out how physically demanding these gyms are? First, it was a tightrope, then rock climbing, skating, and now a rope course? These gym leaders are apparently very into physical fitness. Gould makes his debut in this gym battle by firefanging the jump fluff after an acrobatics. This baits out a bulldozing go-goat, so I swap to Dawkins. He stays relatively healthy with leftovers, but eventually I need to swap, bringing out Kaufman on a critical takedown. Yikes. I take a risk and get a three-hit pen missile, knocking out the goat. That was actually a close one. Weeping Bell uses Acid as Gould comes back out and then promptly falls to a Fire Fang. These gyms seem closer together than I remember. Lysander calls initially to congratulate me on obtaining Mega Evolution, but it quickly devolves into one of his rants about beauty and filth. Um, okay, not quite sure how to respond to that. I do know, however, how much I hate the Lumios Badlands, especially when there's a sandstorm making me go a whole half mile an hour, all the way being accosted by Doug Trios and Gibbles. Badlands is right, this place sucks. So for once, I am relieved to see Team Flare and take refuge in the Taken Over power plant. After defeating the top Flare leaders here, a couple of weirdos dressed in superhero costumes appear to help. Well, great job guys, the battles are already over. South of the Badlands, I encounter this giant of a man who towers over everyone else. Were people just bigger back in the day? Not Serena and I meet up in front of the Eiffel Tower as the power comes back on. No thanks to those superheroes. This tower just so happens to be the next gym, which I would argue is the most prime real estate in the entire Kalos region. How did Clement get so lucky, and where did all that money come from? Seems like a bit of a waste, Pokemon League. My commitment to watching Pokemon finally pays off is I correctly identify Pikachu. It's not like he's the most recognizable Pokemon in the world or anything like that. And then, my good friend Dokken the Espeon makes his return. He obviously needs no introduction. His ideal nature would be modest, but Timid is still pretty good. 
I held off as long as I could without him, because he was my starter in the previous region, so I wanted to give other evolutions a chance to shine. But now, it's time for Darwin to rock. Just not yet. Kaufman leads the battle against Clemence Molga with a charge beam and a discharge. Heliolisk is normally a tough one, but all he can do to Kaufman is quick attack. Dig is weaker than I expected, and I don't want him to have all the fun, so after a few rounds, anticipating a heal, I swap to Gould, who takes Thunderbolt, and after a single flame charge, outspeeds to finish off the Lizard. Magneton uses Electric Terrain, survives an extra turn thanks to Sturdy, but that is broken by a burn. I was all ready to use Darwin here too, looks like it wasn't necessary. For his help in this battle, Kaufman gets the Thunderbolt TM, which is immediately useful in the next major battle. But first, Sycamore wants me to head over to Lysander's Red Cafe. You know, the one being guarded by a Team Flare member? I'm sure that's just a coincidence, and not foreshadowing in any way. Nor is Lysander calling people filth. Just normal conversation, probably. Serena and Trevor then jump me after school in the playground. I think they want my mecha bracelet. Trevor fights with words and Pokedex entries, no problem there. But Serena uses her Pokemon. You know, the same three she's had this whole time. Kaufman has leftovers and gets two special attack boosts from Charge Beam. After stalling for Light Screen to disappear, Meowstic does too. Absol falls to a single Thunderbolt. The fully evolved frog uses a priority Water Shuriken that does about half before falling. You know, if she actually wants to win, maybe use more Pokemon. Like the Kanto starter you got. Whatever happened to that anyway? Our friend group all meets up, so we can head to the scary house. But the scariest thing about this place is the required tip after the story. And speaking of, Gaddy claims to have a scintillating story that is literally just a statement about his evolution stone preference. What kind of story is that? Where's the major conflict? The resolution? This guy would be a horrible writer. And this cafe is a horrible business plan. Food costs more depending on where you sit? What is this? A sport where the closer you are to the cooking action, the more exciting it is? Weirdos. The gym here is like a typical dollhouse, but bigger. And with interdimensional teleportation. I have a dilemma with Haldane, the bold Umbreon. As much as I want to use him, a fairy gym would not be a great debut. The gym leader, Valerie, is impressively strong. Holding up her weird arm wing things like that indefinitely is not easy. Gould takes out Mawile with a single Fire Fang, no problem. Mr. Mime sets up a Reflect and gets burned. Darwin comes out to take a Psychic and respond with a Swift. After making Valerie waste a potion, I bring Gould out to Fire Fang. He has Metronome, so after the first hit, it gets strong enough to be a two-hit KO. I thought limiting my team sizes here would make the gyms a bit more difficult, but they are all so easy. Evolutions are just way too good. Not Serena, and not a girl, are super excited about a Pokeball factory for some reason, so I tag along and discover that Team Flare has taken it over. Even though Serena and I don't get along sometimes, I can still appreciate this sick burn. I make my way through this factory, defeating a number of Team Flare grunts, and try to save the workers, whose main concern is that without Pokeballs, how can we be friends with Pokemon? Yeah, because I love throwing things at my friends and capturing them in interdimensional compressed space. Epitome of friendship right there. Flare Grunts apparently aren't all that smart, because this one, who totally sees me, she's following me with her head and everything, doesn't fight me because I'm not directly in front of her. That's embarrassing. Almost as embarrassing as this admin sales pitch. All it takes is $5 million, and you too can wear a crappy red outfit. With a little help from Serena, we chase away these admins, taking away the commission they certainly would not have gotten. After they leave, the factory president gives me the Pokeball they kept in the back. As I leave, my holo clip picks up a special news bulletin where a reporter says the Pokeball factory was attacked. They don't know who did it, and it will have zero impact on Pokeball sales. That was not very informative. The next Holocaster conversation is better received because Lysander tells me a bit more about Mega Evolution, though it still doesn't explain why Eevee hasn't been graced with such a form. After a brief and uneventful conversation with Sycamore and Dexio, Trevor pops up out of nowhere and feels the need to inform me that he's heading to Frost Cavern to fill his Pokedex. He then proceeds to stand there and do nothing. Very motivated, I see. After saving this contemptible snowman, Diamond, the sassy Eevee, is forced to evolve in the cold to become Glaceon. This icy Eevee is now resistant to guns and germs, but not so much steel. And then, I hurt my Rhyhorn's pride yet again by hitching a ride with a snow pig. In front of the Anister City Gym, Serena once again wants to have a battle. Now, I'm not really going to show much of this fight, because it's basically the same as the previous several times, with one exception. 
After being beaten so evilly by my evolutions, Serena has decided to get one herself and she got Flareon. Now don't get me wrong, I love all of my evolutions, I would never have favorites. But in a much more real sense, if I was only going to get one, it would probably not have been Flareon. Anyway, Moran makes short work of this Eevee traitor. Unlike most gym leaders, Olympia doesn't waste time talking. She knows that my research time is valuable. Kaufman has a magnet, but even with that, his charge beam doesn't quite take out the Sigilyph. After taking a Psychic and missing a second charge beam, Thunderbolt does knock it out. I had assumed that a special attack boost would be necessary for Slowking, but I guess not. Against Meowstic, I bring out Haldane, who takes figuratively nothing from a Fake Out and a few Shadow Balls. With leftovers, he stays fully healed and defeats this Psychic Cat. We have lots of experience with that, don't we? As I leave the gym, Lysander sends out a message to everyone that he is about to destroy every non-Team Flare member. But if he had just done it, instead of broadcasting his intentions, I would have been none the wiser. As it is, in order to safeguard the future of humanity, I need to find him. Serena runs off half-cocked with no idea where to go. I, on the other hand, use my fully evolved brain and interrogate these flare grunts who drop not so subtle clues. Inside Lysander's way too red cafe, his interior decorator needs to get fired, a random piece of furniture gives off mysterious vibes. Behind said furniture is a door leading to Lysander. We have several almost identical battles over the next few minutes, but I'm only going to discuss the last one because it's the most interesting. I also meet up with the mysterious kids again, who give Saiyaman a run for his money, being the lamest superhero ever. Especially since she gives me revives. These are worthless. Just like every other good lab, Lysander's has a prison section where it houses the tallest man ever. He tells me a sad story about a permanently fainted Pokemon and his ability to bring things back to life. Now over the next few minutes, I'm afraid my recording captured some random text from Pokalink. I was going to try to start using it to sync my team, but I thought I had turned it off. So just do your best to ignore that text, okay? I would skip all this, but there are a few important fights here. For example, Lysander goes all Thanos before it was cool, saying that we have limited resources and instead of increasing them, we should just decrease the consumers. In other words, he wants to eliminate all Pokemon too, which, believe it or not, Studying evolution without Eevees might be a tad difficult. After watching some weird life-stealing bird flop out of a cocoon, Kaufman takes him out with a few Thunderbolts. But he stays around because I need to capture him. Alright, immediately after doing so, Doc Ock Lysander shows up one last time. Now, unfortunately, I didn't realize that capturing this guy meant he was placed at the front of my team, and as you can probably tell, this thing is not an Eevee. Quite the opposite, in fact. In order to not risk an Eevee on the swap, I let Eevee Killer spam disable until it falls. I bet Lysander is feeling pretty good about himself right now. He did just defeat a legendary Pokemon after all. And then Darwin makes an appearance. He psychics the Mindshu and the Pyroar too, who does survive the hit, but a dazzling gleam takes him out. And thanks to Metronome, it's now powered up to one-shot the Honchkrow as well. Unfortunately, it's nowhere near strong enough for the Mega Gyarados. So I swap to Moran on an Aqua Tail, need to risk a crit to hit with a Surf, and survives an Outrage. Now Dawkins baits out an Iron Head that Kaufman can take. With that tiny bit of Surf damage, an Expert Belt Thunderbolt defeats the Mega Snake. Even after my victory, Lysander uses the bit of power left in the machine to shoot itself. Not sure why, but I'm not about to complain. Now one good thing about owning a legendary flying Pokemon is that now I can fly. And while I'm at it, I might as well force him to learn Cut too. Why not? In the Sycamore battle, I lead with Darwin, who still has Metronome. A single Psychic takes out the Venusaur, but I got way too cocky here. I didn't bother doing any calcs, and the Blastoise's Aqua Tail takes me down to a red. If I had lost Darwin to this turtle, I would never have forgiven myself. Thankfully, it doesn't happen, and then the Charizard falls in one hit, after I verify that he would. Quick question though, didn't Sycamore give away his Kanto starters at the beginning? You know, the ones that my rivals never use? How many backups does this guy have? Is that why Professor Oak ran out of Pokemon for Ash because Sycamore hoards them all? As I'm minding my own business crossing a bridge, Not Serena pops up behind me and asks if I know what's going to happen. Um, no? Turns out she and the rest of my friends are gonna gang up on me. Even without the chance to change my team around, these battles actually go decently well. With that, it's time for the last gym. Or apparently not. This old geezer is said to know the ultimate Pokemon move, but I guess my Eevees aren't good enough. For the very last evolution, my Lax Wallace becomes a leafy boy. 
In spite of being the most earthy evolution, Wallace looks to the stars and wonders about Evie's place in the universe. Did you know he was originally going to be part of Gen 2? Here's the beta sprite they were going to use that I randomly came across during this playthrough. It was pretty good timing, actually. With that, it's time for the last gym. For real this time. Gould takes out the snowman with an expert belted flame charge. Avalug has incredible defense, but not so great special. So it's a lava plume for him. Cryogonal is the opposite, with only 50 base defense. I didn't realize it was that low. Thanks to flame charge, Gould outspeeds and does not miss the 95% accurate fire fang. The victory road guard doesn't just count my badges this time, he actually challenges me to a poke battle. After which, we enter victory road. And this is one intense lock. It must be a pain to reset this after each participant enters. At the end of victory road, the annoying text is finally gone. But another annoying thing appears to have one last battle. And as always, she starts with Meowstic, who does absolutely nothing to Haldane and is gone in a few hits. Darwin's special attack is lowered by Altaria, so he goes for a calm mind, only for it to be lowered again. Come on. Oh, and he was crit too. Darn Altaria. Dawkins stays in to take an Ice Beam and still one-shots Greninja. This baits out a Flareon, who Moran can defeat easily enough. And then, she might as well stay in to surf the Absol. I feel kind of bad for Serena, to be honest. Not only do I beat her at every turn, but I took the Mega Evolution Bracelet out from under her and never used it. But it was vital to learn more about Evolution. Anyway, it's now time to pick my Eevee Elite 4 team. While all of these guys are solid, I decide to leave Umbreon and Glaceon in the box. I know Umbreon is a great pivot tank, but my strategies shouldn't need that. After some last minute prep and leveling up, let's begin the last leg of the run. I decide to start with Malva in the Blazing Chamber, because I want to be burnt to a crisp, apparently. Obviously Moran, who is like 90% water or something, starts to put out the fire. Pyroar uses a Noble Roar, unfortunately, to lower her special attack, but a Surf still takes it out. Talonflame outspeeds to Brave Bird, but still falls in a Surf. Moran has Protect, by the way, so she can heal from leftovers, but it ends up being unnecessary as the Torkoal and even the Chandelure fall in one Surf each. I guess that Lion's attack drop didn't even matter. Next, I head to the Flood Chamber to battle Cybolt. Can I just say, as far as the Elite Four room designs go, Kalos is up there at the top, even if I would get soaked during the battle. If you thought the last fight was easy, this one is even simpler. An expert belted Kaufman comes out and could Thunderbolt all of his team. But midway through, I needlessly pivot to Wallace on a Stone Edge to Leaf Blade the Barbarical and the Starmie too. Sometimes you just need to make your evolutions share their prey. Next, I mean to head to the Dragon Lady, but accidentally enter the Ironworks room instead. Okay, I was trying to save this one for last, but I guess not. Wickstrom starts with Klefki and I with Gould. The key falls to a flamethrower after setting up some spikes. This baits out Probopass, so Gould pivots to Wallace, who actually takes a lot from Power Gem, more than I thought he would. He heals with a synthesis, and I decide to risk a crit. After a leaf blade, he is not crit, and just like a kid looking for gold, digs into the giant nose. If it weren't for Sturdy, he would have started with that move. Now Wallace baits out an X Scizor that Gould can handle pretty well. He stalls with Protect to get some healing, and Flamethrowers the bug. Last is Aegislash. If Wickram actually knew what he was doing, because Gould outspeeds, I would be in a lot of trouble. Thankfully, all Gould has to do is use Protect to get Aegislash into its blade form, and Wickram, who is an idiot, does not use King Shield. So a Flamethrower takes him out. Aegislash is one of those Pokemon that if you use him right is super useful, but the AI sometimes just doesn't. And now, it's on to Drasna's Dragon Mark Chamber. Since she leads with Dragalge, Darwin starts and one-shots with a Psychic. He immediately pivots to Dawkins on the Altaria's Moonblast, who is Moonblasted right back. Noivern obviously outspeeds, but only does half with a Super Fang and falls in love anyway. And Drudigan never stood a chance. Right now, I'm feeling pretty good about myself, actually. At this point in the Sinnoh run, spoiler alert, I had already lost one evolution and then lost two more in the champion fight. So as long as I don't sacrifice half my team against Diantha, I will have improved my evolution record. Haulucha is immediately psychic by Darwin, and while the Gorgos could deal decent damage with a priority shadow sneak, she instead sees the kill with a phantom force that she will never get to use. Thanks to that fodder, a metronome boosted psychic can one-shot Tyrantrum. 
Now, the Aurora survives the hit and does set up a light screen, which is what I assumed was going to happen, but now it means I have to stall. First, I pivot to Wallace on a full restore to Leaf Blade this dino. He baits out Gudra's Fire Blast that Gould absorbs, which in turn baits out a Muddy Water that Moran can absorb. At this point, the light screen wears off, and Moran goes for an Ice Beam, freezing the Gudra. Well, that's awesome. Gudra didn't pose any real threat here, but hopefully this will make Diantha's ace quite a bit easier. Gardevoir Mega evolves, but is still outsped because the first turn utilizes your non-Mega speed. Surf does more than half as Moran survives a Thunderbolt. And so, Kaufman comes out to absorb the Thunderbolt and responds with his own Magnet Boosted Bolt that finishes off her last Pokemon. So it turns out I became the champion of Kalos without losing a single evolution. That's pretty awesome. After becoming the champion, there is a giant celebration in Lumio City. After all, I did just save the world. But why are the rest of these losers here? What did they even do? Giant Man King AZ wants to battle me in front of everybody, for some reason, which begs the question, why do his Pokemon suck so bad? I mean, he's been wandering the Earth for 3,000 years, you think he'd have better Pokemon than a Torkoal, a Sigilyph, and a Golurk. Or, if nothing else, they should at least be level 100 by now. But I guess he is a prime example of what happens when you don't evolve. You end up sucking at Pokemon battles. After that, there's a touching moment where a Floet drops from the sky, but whatever. The important thing is that my Evolutions and I have now conquered Kalos as well as Sinnoh. I know I've joked about this in the run, but it does make sense that there aren't any Mega Evolutions. I mean, it wouldn't really be fair to give Eevee more than one Mega Evolution while there are tons of other Pokemon that don't have any. Yes, I'm looking at you, Charizard and Mewtwo. But at the same time, I wish there were at least a Mega Eevee. That would be pretty awesome. If I decide to continue with this Evolution series, which game should I try next? I've done Sinnoh and Kalos, so basically anything else is an option. Let me know, and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next region.